Hi, my name is Chris McClendon. I'm a geologist. I worked for about 40 years in the oil and gas industry in South Louisiana doing subsurface interpretation. Recently moved over to the carbon capture arena, but for about the past 15 years I've had an independent consulting company. And as a part of that, I've worked with uh, universities uh, to provide them access to industry seismic data for primarily for near surface and surface geology, extrapolating the, the deeper subsurface uh, to to the surface, and I, and I think the implications for that are pretty significant. I want to share some of that with you today. Uh, this is a recorded version of a presentation that I gave at the Louisiana Engineering Society Joint Conference on February 24th, 2023, and my purpose is to present the uh, value and utility of a subsurface geological atlas, which would be constructed through university research uh, that I have had this experience with. So I want to share some of that with you and, and try to lay the case for constructing a subsurface geological atlas of South Louisiana. The uh, presentation outline, we'll look at uh, some of this uh, amazing new data which has come about in the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, surface velocity measurements, uh, the surface of South Louisiana is all in motion, both vertically and horizontally. Uh, we're beginning to get a much better understanding of the stress fields across the surface of the Earth. All of, all of that is under some degree of stress. Some of that could be important. Uh, we've gotten dramatic new uh, satellite imagery, which allows us to measure change in the Earth's surface over time. And then the geology component is what I've been involved with. And we'll look at the integration among those four sets of new data. The main purpose of this really, I think, is, is to try to get a handle on sustainability, the longer term sustainability of South Louisiana. And certainly that means infrastructure, uh, the hard infrastructure, if you will. We'll look at uh, those examples of those, but also the underlying natural infrastructure, uh, the surface of the land itself. All, all hard infrastructure is embedded within the land surface and is inherently dependent on the sustainability, particularly in the coastal wetlands. And then the role of geology in understanding those, uh, how, how geology factors in, affects, and, and can, can help better understand uh, how changes are occurring and what those impacts might be on sustainability. And the primary geological feature we'll be looking at are faults. Uh, I'll show some examples uh, in detail. We'll talk about the inception and growth of faulting, the slink, sinking and sliding motion of faults, and then start to get some ideas about the magnitude and frequency of fault slip events, which are occurring in South Louisiana, although they, are, they can be difficult to detect. And finally, integrate all that to, to talk about an atlas, how it would come together, how it could be used, highlight uh, areas of interest um, where we might want initially want to focus, and then the foundation for predictive models on how all this data can be integrated uh, to, to make models that, that will tell us uh, give us indications about how changes are going to happen in the future. New data for South Louisiana has come in these four major silos, surface velocities, stress fields, satellite imagery, and subsurface geology. And we'll look at each one of those individually to get some idea of, of, of what I'm talking about and then talk about the integration among them. Surface velocities are primarily measured now by the uh, static GPS stations of the cores, continually operating reference system network. This is operated nationally by NOAA's uh, National Geodetic Survey and locally managed by the LSU Center for Geoinformatics. And in the lower right, there's a representation of the vertical velocities as colored dots ranging from about a millimeter a year to up to seven millimeters a year along the coast. And then the arrows indicate the, the direction and magnitude of horizontal movement with a, a one meter, uh, one millimeter per year scale here in, uh, in the lower left. So uh, this is surprising to many people that the, the surface of the earth is in motion and attempting to better understand why that is and what the implications for that motion are uh, is gonna be important. Uh, there's also been a fascinating new study recently came out of LSU which looked at uh, a higher degree of detail. So these are, these are uh, data from uh, 12 core stations here. You can see each one produces a cloud of data. Uh, the values represented on a previous map are derived from a linear regression through that cloud. So the slope of that linear regression line is basically the, 
uh, the rate of subsidence. But within that, there is a wavy uh, variation that appears to be a seasonal variation. And this uh, LSU study made the first attempt to relate that to the seasonal variation in the river stage and tidal stages. So the implications are that the weight of the water during a high river stage causes the earth to flex uh, downward and then it rebounds uh, when the water level drops. So part of the motion of the surface of the earth in the short term is due to these changes in water level in the rivers. And, and uh, I think that's going to be very important to understand in more detail going forward. Stress fields are just beginning to be understood. Uh, we don't have much data in South Louisiana right now. The closest data, uh, which comes from the World Stress Map Project, uh, which is managed by, managed by Mark Zoback um, and his wife. Uh, Zoback is a geomechanics professor at Stanford University. And these are uh, vectors of, of stress uh, in closest to Louisiana have been determined by hydraulic fracturing in the Haynesville and Eagleford. Uh, fracturing a rock determines minimal princ minimum principal stress, and if you know the orientation of the fractures, you can get a directional orientation with that. In South Louisiana, it will be uh, entire, almost entirely dominated by normal faulting, the, the response to stress, and this is in which the vertical component of stress is much greater than either of the horizontal components, so faults will slide uh, primarily vertically. In other areas of the country, uh, the the uh, vertical stress component can be between the two horizontal components, in which case you get strike slip faulting, represented by these green vectors uh, in California. Or if, this, if the uh, vertical component is less than either of the horizontal components, you'll get thrust faulting, uh, represented by the red, I believe, uh, on the map. But we're just going to uh, involve ourselves with normal faulting, in which the the uh, vertical component, primarily due to sedimentary overburden, uh, drives the the, uh, the movement of, of faults. And and uh, another very recent development uh, at LSU has been seismic monitoring. In this case, uh, they set out an array of monitors uh, to to listen for seismic uh, responses. The common knowledge in South Louisiana has always been that. Uh, faults are aseismic, meaning they don't produce a seismic response that could be detected. Uh, that's not true. Uh, they're more correctly characterized as micro-seismic events, meaning you have to have uh, monitors very close to the source. So uh, hopefully this will be an increasing development. Uh, where we'll set up more of these monitoring stations and start to record the micro-seismic events. I believe that these are responses to fault movement. And, and, and it's significant to me that over a three-month period, uh, they recorded two events. Uh, so it, it would indicate they're happening fairly often. And if we can collect a body of data on this, uh, we may be able to get more, a better understanding of how faults are moving and, and the range in magnitude and, and the frequency of those events. The, the satellite data, the, the uh, imagery, uh, allows us to measure uh, changes in the land surface area. Uh, this really came into uh, full force in the uh, 2011 report by the USGS in which they did these detailed measurements of change over the last, uh, almost the last century now. Um, and it's, it's important to understand where uh, these changes are occurring and the, uh, the temporal range. So this is a, on the lower left is a graph of the uh, rate of wetlands loss over time. And you can see that in the in the Terrebonne and Barataria uh, basins, that wetlands loss peaked in the mid 70s and 80s, and I believe it represented a, a land loss event. Uh, rates of land loss have have been continuously declining since then, and in fact, the data shows uh, that over the past decade, there's been a modest gain in wetlands area. So understanding how these changes are occurring, relating them to the surface velocity measurements and to the subsurface geology is going to be proved to be one of the most important things in uh, getting a better handle on long-term sustainability in South Louisiana. And finally, subsurface geology. This is the area that I've been involved with. Uh, I've had the honor to sit on two of the thesis committees for these research projects here. Uh, we've got a modest coverage now. Most of this has come from uh, seismic data that was either donated by industry
or in which access was provided through an internship. And we'll look at one of these projects uh, in detail to see how, how it comes together and what the implications for this are. The purpose of, of this recommendation is to complete this, to get a, a, a set of university, university projects uh, enough to cover South Louisiana with these interpretations and then combine them into an atlas, which will be available in a GIS format for for uh, anybody to integrate into uh, into their evaluation of, of anything that might involve uh, the surface of South Louisiana. Uh, this is going to require some funding to get this done, and that's really the purpose of my recommendation here. So to date, each one of these individual areas of uh, uh, data collection have resided in independent silos. They really don't. Uh, get integrated to any significant extent. And that's really where the value is going to come from. As we start to, as I mentioned, integrate the surface velocity data with the change in, in uh, land area here, integrate the subsurface geology with surface velocities and satellite imagery, and then understanding the, the stress fields and how fault movement is related to uh, stress fields and how that affects surface velocity. So it's in this interior uh, area integration among these various data sets where the real value is going to come. So the, I think the, the real underlying purpose is, is to uh, provide a basis for better understanding the long-term sustainability of South Louisiana. And among the most important aspects of that certainly is infrastructure. So we're talking about roads, rail, electric, the electric grid, the transmission lines, and the power plants natural gas infrastructure, pipelines, gas processing plants, and, and the increasing number of LNG facilities, export facilities, uh, which Louisiana is, is dominating the market on currently. Uh, the petrochemical industry, which includes all the refineries, chemical plants, the major oil pipelines, the strategic petroleum reserve. There are two uh, installations in Louisiana by Choctaw and Hackberry, where oil is, is stored for strategic use. Uh, in salt domes, and then the offshore uh, Louisiana offshore oil port facilities, which allow for the import and export of oil. And, and there is another export facility in the plans here. So uh, these are really important components of, of uh, the national uh, energy security and, and the national economy. Uh, perhaps the most important for the average person is a flood protection infrastructure. Uh, this is a network of levees uh, existing and proposed. Um, and, and I'm going to focus toward the end on uh, how a subsurface geological atlas could help to uh, better manage uh, this system in terms of the potential for a geological event, a fault slip event, and what that might mean. And we'll look very specifically at one uh, with, with, to understand what the implications of that are. And of course, navigation, uh, the, the, the port system of South Louisiana taken together is one of the largest in the world. It's a vital component to the national economy and the sustainability of that port system um, is, is crucial to the economy. And I think uh, understanding the geology, understanding the relationship between subsurface geology and the sustainability of this port system uh, is, is, is very important to, to the national economy in the long term. So we look at all these components of the hard infrastructure, if you will, that built up at the surface, and there it is all embedded in the natural environment. So I think it's important to recognize the, the aspect of the natural infrastructure, these coastal ecosystems. Ultimately, the sustainability of, of the hard infrastructure is going to be dependent on the sustainability of the natural infrastructure. And it's, it's perhaps a much clearer relationship between subsurface geology and the sustainability of these ecosystems, uh, which we can demonstrate. And a, a part of that, part of that uh, challenge to sustainability is a recognition of wetlands loss over the past century. Uh, understanding how that has occurred, how it might progress uh, going forward, I'm hopeful that we may actually begin to develop models for how changes will occur in the future that will integrate uh, geology into that so that we can get a better understanding of what changes are likely to occur in the, in the coming decades. 
And of course, managing the sustainability is the role of uh, CPRA through the Coastal Master Plan. And one of my hopes is that uh, the construction of an atlas would provide uh, a, a, an important input to design, planning, and imp implementation of coastal master plan projects, knowing the geology on which these, these uh, projects are going to be constructed or how they might be affected by changes driven by geology is going to prove to be very important. So I hope that if we construct a, a master plan, if we construct an atlas, that uh, the master plan will make use of it uh, in, in project planning and design. So how does geology factor in? Um, we looked at all these uh, variation, various uh, aspects of infrastructure and, uh, and uh, implied the significance of geology, but let's look at it in more detail. Right now, the current state uh, is uh, of geology, surface geology, is primarily managed by the USGS and the Louisiana Geological Survey. Through the USGS state map program, the Louisiana Geological Survey has produced these interpretations. These are geological formations exposed at the surface, uh, the various color codes, and then the surface traces of fault. So we have a very uh, solid understanding of faults largely north of I-10, I-12, uh, and that's because they're expressed as escarpments, which can be uh, measured and, and, and mapped uh, using LIDAR digital elevation models. The more complete understanding is going to have to come from integrating subsurface and, and primarily using seismic data. So I'll show you examples. If we can see faults extending from the, surf, from the subsurface toward the surface and then look for indications of expression, uh, sometimes they become very clear. They're not going to be as, as clearly obvious as an escarpment uh, on a LIDAR digital elevation model. But I'll show you examples uh, where they, they are clear, and, 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 and that's why I hope through university research we can develop a more complete atlas. Um, and the color codes here are, are let me go back just a sec, the, uh, the blue are faults that are down to the south, the red are faults that are down to the north, and these are, these are primarily from the university projects here. These, uh, these purple uh, lineations here are beneath the uh, floodplain of the Mississippi River. So during the last ice age, um, the, the surface escarpments were eroded off. Uh, they almost certainly extend. We can see the, the faults extend in the subsurface. There's no reason they wouldn't uh, have ha expression. They've just been uh, geologically recently eroded. So getting a better understanding of these is going to require subsurface geology too, and they may have significant implications, particularly for flood protection infrastructure up here. So we think about all of the uh, infrastructure across South Louisiana and then layer on uh, our current understanding of faults, and it, and, and it points to one of the purposes of the atlas. If we can, if we can get an integration, a GIS uh, integration, of these surface traces and start to look for areas where faults are crossing critical components of infrastructure and then see if we can detect either vertical motion or uh, micro seismic events or possibly even indications of impacts that we just might not have considered otherwise uh, were being caused by faults. This is really the purpose uh, of, of an Atlas project is, is to start to look at uh, impacts that might be occurring and then ultimately to derive a model for what the probable distribution of magnitude and frequency of slip events is and, 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 and what the occurrence of those high-end events. If they're, if we're going to talk about a, potentially a fault slip event of a one foot of displacement. That would have an impact on any piece of infrastructure across South Louisiana. Indications are that's probably not going to occur more than about once every thousand years or so, uh, but certainly we can get a better handle on that. But it's still a worthwhile effort to to examine what a slip event of that magnitude would do and where we should be most concerned about it happening, maybe even uh, setting up some contingency plans uh, for for the occurrence of an event like that. So most people have a general conception of the subsurface of Louisiana being layers of sedimentary rock, kind of a layer cake uh, configuration below the surface. Uh, 
In reality, it's much more complex than that. Uh, these sedimentary layers are there, but they've been deformed significantly since their deposition as an original sedimentary layer. And the primary uh, mechanisms of deformation are faults. This one right here showing offset, vertical offset. So the sedimentary layers are, are down dropped on one side and thicker, meaning that they were continuously subsiding where the fault was continuously moving during deposition. The black is salt, which was squeezed up from an original uh, layer of salt deposited when the Gulf of Mexico was first opening. Salt is low density, ductile, and is squeezed out by the weight of the overlying sediment. So it's a, it's a significant component of, uh, of deformation in the subsurface. And then through this university research, we're getting an appreciation that these faults, and even the LIDAR uh, faults here, uh, we focus on the surface expression, but there is a subsurface component to that. And if we understand the history of movement on these, uh, we can get a much better understanding of what the implications for movement might be at the surface. So we're going to look at three examples here, uh, the Baton Rouge Fault, the Highway 11 Fault, and the Montague Fault, and then uh, one more at Vachery, which is out side of this image here, but uh, it's, it's, it's one that's got some significant implications there. The Baton Rouge Fault, uh, we would Im image this as a fault plane. So this is the subsurface fault plane. The colors go from uh, hot to cool, from shallow to deep. The contours here are a thousand feet uh, difference in elevation. So this ranges from uh, 20,000 feet at depth up to a zero depth contour, which is the, the surface trace of the fault. Let's zoom in a little bit and look at this in more detail. Uh, the values here are the depths at which the fault was in, uh, encountered by an oil and gas well. This is standard practice in oil and gas industry to determine where a fault cuts a well in the subsurface and it's part of the exploration process. Um, so we can construct these subsurface fault planes. Uh, in, in, in three dimensions, that plane looks something like this. So you can see it's it's really a slide surface in which one side of the fault is sliding relative to the other, causing uh, movement. It looks like that movement is continual, but episodic, but it's also cumulative. So even though it's a, a series of what may be very small events, over time they, they build up to a cumulative effect. And that may have some uh, effect on stresses at the surface. We'll consider that. So let's look at a profile here. This is a, a set of well logs, which we can use to look at a profile of the fault in the subsurface. This would be the profile of that fault plane uh, connecting these wells together. And one of the one of the important components of faults in South Louisiana is that the displacement continues to increase with depth. That's why we call them growth faults. And this is a, this is a, a result of the cumulative effect. So every movement uh, on the on the fault over time adds up to where you get to, in this case, three or four hundred feet of displacement at depth. Uh, and we'll see the surface trace. Uh, it has got about 15 feet of displacement in the recent geological past. And the reason we know so much about this is that faults play a critical component uh, in the in the uh, accumulation of oil and gas. Uh, Baton Rouge Fault is also significant in that it cuts through the Southern Hills Aquifer. And one of the aspects uh, that is of concern is that faults are conduits can be conduits for fluid migration. And in this case, we know that salt water has been migrating up the Baton Rouge Fault and into uh, the drinking water aquifer. So this is a map of the progression of a saltwater plume in South Baton Rouge over the past uh, couple of decades in the deeper, one of the deeper uh, aquifers. Um, and that's just one aspect of faulting. So our, if we consider our, our subsurface fault plane, and, and just for context where we are, this is uh, in Baton Rouge, uh, I-12 coming in from the east, I-10 coming up from the south, airline highway. So the trace is running right along there. And on the on the LIDAR digital elevation model, the escarpment is, is obvious. It might not be obvious to the average person, but if you were to stand here on a College Drive 
right next to Corporate Mall, looking north, you can see that that's that's the that's the 15 feet of elevation difference. If you're familiar with the area, the Fairway View Apartments is right here uh, to the right. Um, but that that's a good expression of the uh, surface escarpment uh, of a fault measured by LIDAR digital elevation models. One of the important recent studies coming out of Tulane um, attempted to measure the average rate of slip over a recent geological time. So they took uh, borings on either side of the fault, uh, dated them using a advanced technology to get uh, accurate dates uh, of the of the age of the sedimentary layers, and then the, using the elevation difference on either side of the fault. And they determined that the average slip rate uh, over 130,000 years was about one and a half inches per thousand years. Uh, that's a very low rate, and, and for most people that would not be a concern. But we'll see that rates vary across South Louisiana. This is the low end component. Uh, and so while this would not be much of a concern, as those slip rates increase, um, uh, the the uh, potential impact of them becomes greater. It's also important uh, to understand that it's it's a, a, it's a, a documented geologic phenomenon. The longer the period of time over which you measure geological events, the lower the average rate is going to be, and that's because of the episodic nature of things like this. So embedded within this, there may have been slip events that were three or four inches in a given year. But because of the uh, low average rate, uh, those, those values are diminished or, or diluted over that longer period of time. So that we looked at that example of the LIDAR map fault in Baton Rouge. This is how all these faults were mapped. Uh, and again, I mentioned the, the uh, floodplain in the Mississippi River eroded the escarpments, which were almost certainly there prior to that erosion. Uh, and this, the faults continue, we know, in the subsurface below that. Uh, now we're going to look at how we, we, we have measured or uh, mapped these faults uh, when we can't use LIDAR data uh, in South Louisiana. And we'll start with the Highway 11 fault. Uh, this is one which uh, a coincidence of things came together, uh, which allowed us to make a pretty solid determination. Uh, one, after the recognition of the fault on seismic, uh, the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation ran a uh, real-time kinematic elevation survey on the bridge, and you can see very distinct offsets on the Highway 11 bridge fault here to the north end of the, of the bridge and the South Point fault uh, to the south end. And zooming in on, the, on this northern, uh, we can actually get uh, estimates of the rate of movement here, very close to the fault, um, 1.2 inches per year. So significantly higher than the average rate uh, on the Baton Rouge fault. That's both because it's it's further to the south, but also it's a shorter period of time over which that uh, movement was measured. And then uh, there happened to have been a USGS high resolution seismic line shot adjacent to the bridge where you can see a very clear uh, imaging of the fault, the offset of the sedimentary layers in the top 100 or so feet. This is an incredibly rare image in South Louisiana for reason I don't really understand. Uh, we, we just have not made an attempt to collect high resolution data. I think it would be a really important thing to consider to get more images across these faults because if we had dates on these sedimentary layers then we could reconstruct the movement and determine something about the history of movement over time. So let's do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reconstruct this back to when this blue layer was just below the surface here and then advance it going forward. So you can see, because of the movement of the fault, more sediment is accumulating on the downthrown side of the fault than the upthrown side. This means there's more weight uh, on this side, which is going to continue to drive. So it's a feedback loop in which the movement of the fault allows for more sediment accumulation on one side. That differential load causes the fault to continually move. And that's why there is continual episodic movement. And then most recently, we've had uh, an offset that you can see on the guardrail uh, of the bridge. So this is both a, a, an indication of uh, recent movement uh, in the last few decades or so, but also one of the examples of potential impacts on infrastructure. It hasn't affected motor traffic on the bridge, uh, 
but it is it is something that's worth considering uh, this type of uh, offset uh, on other forms of infrastructure which might be more directly impacted. Let's go down to the Montague Fault. This is one of the university research projects that I was involved in. Uh, we, we got donation of seismic data uh, and a dissertation out of, out of Tulane um, produced uh, some excellent interpretation on vaults in South Louisiana. Similar to the Baton Rouge Fault, there is a fault plane uh, which can be mapped and measured. Uh, in this case, this, this component was done with a 3D seismic survey. This was donated to Tulane by Cytel Incorporated that owned the data. And I'm going to show you two examples of seismic profiles across here. So one of those uh, to the eastern side shows the Montague Fault. This is the, the subsurface uh, profile representation of the fault. You can see the sedimentary layers here are uh, tied to seismic horizons or seismic reflectors. And you can see the offset of the fault with depth in this listric form in which faults uh, tend to tend toward a horizontal plane with a depth. And you can, this, this is a profile, but you can kind of imagine a fault plane in the third dimension extending through that. So this is a profile across the fault in that manner. In the other orientation, the Montague Fault is to the back here. We have two more, the Ill John Charles and the Lake Boudreaux Fault. And if we simplify that diagram a little bit, you can see these are the sedimentary layers being offset by the fault, the listric move movement of the fault, and a three-dimensional three representation of the three faults. So the Montague Fault is in the back, the Ill de John Charles Fault, and the Lake Boudreaux Fault, and the profile cuts them in this direction, so we see. Uh, each one of these, and the, the surface traces then uh, ex are, are, are represented by these blue lines. Uh, the surface offset is not really measurable. I'll show you an indication of it, but uh, below the surface, the offset increases with depth. So that, that is, again, representative of continual episodic movement on the fault, and the, these are the surface traces of those faults in blue. And one of the one of the ways in which we can see impacts is from uh, elevation surveys of the benchmarks along the highway here. So three, these four of these faults actually cross uh, this highway. And a study of uh, elevation resurveying elevation benchmarks to determine subsidence rates over time. The change in elevation is a measurement of subsidence rates. The values are the maximum subsidence rates measured. Uh, by those uh, resurveying epochs, and you can see there's a very close correlation between where the subsidence rate increases over a period of decades and where these faults are expressed. This anathetic fault is a, one of the red faults. It's down to the north, so the area between them is is down dropped uh, relative to uh, either side. And I think this is probably about as good an expression as you're going to get of uh, fault movement in South Louisiana. But you can also see where, where those uh, higher uh, subsidence rates are can be tied to wetlands law. So this is a case where understanding uh, surface velocities, now these are historical surface velocities because they're, they're uh, derived from resurveying benchmarks, but where those values were higher on the downthrown side of these faults correlates very well with where wetlands loss is occurring. And, and the traces of the fault. So it appears very probable that movement on the faults in these cases uh, is the cause of wetlands loss. And we can see that um, the, the surface expressions, once you know where they are from the subsurface, there are, uh, there are lineations that make logical sense. And where wetlands loss has occurred across these, I mentioned uh, reconstructing uh, Using, using this data to reconstruct what the marks look like in the past. This was done by uh, Louisiana Sea Grant. So we, from satellite or from aerial photography in this case, uh, we can reconstruct what the marks looked like in 1932 and then 1973, 75 rather, and then 2014. So that's, that's uh, an indication of the movement on these faults, subsidence driven by fault movement, and where wetlands losses occurred. And Dr. Woody Gagliano uh, 
took a series of borings across uh, the Montague Fault, and he found two things of significance. One, the layer of peat uh, is thicker on the downthrown side, indicating that the fault has been moving in recent time. Uh, peat uh, accumulates by organic growth to keep up with the rate of subsidence. So the subsidence rate is higher, the thickness of the peat will be higher, but also an offset of that peat layer at the surface. And that value is about two and a half feet. And we can infer from the satellite imagery that that movement occurred over a period of maybe 15 to 20 years. So it's not, it's not exact, it's not really a scientific value, but it gives you a pretty good intuitive feeling of the rate of movement on that fault. And, and we'll come back and look at see how that fits into the range of overall movements. So we looked at these three faults here, uh, but they, all of those implications uh, apply to the other ones. It is an interconnected network of faults and we're continually gaining a better understanding of that. Um, the inception of fault slip uh, starts on the lower continental slope. Uh, the, this is primarily clays deposited out here. Uh, they're very inefficient at dewatering after deposition, so pore pressures can build up to pretty significant levels at, at shallow depths. And that increase in pore pressure affects the frictional strength along, along any given bedding plane. So the, the uh, weight of the sediment normal to that bedding plane, there's a shear stress along uh, along the bedding plane and then the frictional strength with high pore pressures this frictional strength can become so low that the uh, ratio of normal to shear stress causes uh, movement along that bedding plane and that is the inception of slip you get a sliding motion with a, a extension and compression and then fracturing occurs during that uh, fault movement and allows the fluid to escape so initially high pore pressures uh, set up the conditions uh, for slip. The slip occurs, allowing the fluid to escape, and then the, the cycle repeats. Pressures build up and slip again uh, occurs again. Uh, but over time, as you introduce a weight of sediment, you get that feedback loop. So from the lower continental slope in South Louisiana, deltas are continually prograding toward the center of the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, delta deposits feed into these when this is right at the mouth of the river at, in the Miocene when uh, deposition was most significant, fault movement was most significant, and then the, the deltas are pretty much built past that now, and we still have uh, propagational movement uh, coming up to the surface. This is a representation of the Bastion Bay Fault uh, in western Plaquemine Parish, but you can see how it moved over time. So again, each of these faults uh, has a history similar to this, uh, has moved over time. And you can see by, by the configuration that there is both a downward and a horizontal component. We call this a de Colmont surface in which vertical movement is translated into horizontal movement. And there's a distinct sliding motion that occurs uh, deep along these faults. And this, I believe, is a principal uh, mechanism for surface velocity. So there's both a sinking and a sliding which manifest as these vertical and horizontal velocities uh, that we can measure from the core stations. So uh, Roy Docker used to call this down and out. Uh, Louisiana is sinking and sliding toward the center of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the most important thing I, to take away from me is that there is a mechanism uh, driving those surface velocities and its implications uh, for how the, the movement may be expressed at the surface is going to be really important. So we've looked at these three faults, uh, one that was just outside of our uh, image profile there um, is the Vashri fault, but it's really important. Uh, that's because it had a significant fault slip event in recent history. Uh, this was in 1943, April of 1943, uh, the fault ruptured the surface of the earth. It appears that it happened over a period of about two or three days. It wasn't instantaneous, but the offset at the surface was eight inches. So compare uh, one and a half inches per thousand years to eight inches in three days. You get the range of, uh, again, to get an idea of the range of magnitude of fault slip events. Uh, this fault was studied by Dr. Harold Fisk for his report to the Mississippi River Commission. 
and he made a couple of findings when he, he took a boring profile across the fault to see its history of movement, but he also related where the fault intersected the river with a historical crevasse. And his implication was that movement on the fault had caused a crevasse of the river. This is probably the most important thing that I'm going to say today, that we know that in geological history, this was probably 2,000 years ago or so, uh, movement on a fault did cause a crevasse of the river, which would be a traumatic event, a uh, catastrophic event if it occurred today. Uh, this is the configuration. The fault is, is connected to the Hester Salt Dome. Uh, the plane comes up to the surface. There is a surface trace, which was visible with that rupture. It intersected the river, and the crevasse channel propagates from that. So this is the where that where the trace intersects the river. This is the uh, crevasse splay deposit, which is significant in size, meaning this is a massive event to have this much sediment uh, deposited. Uh, th again, this would have been utterly catastrophic if it were happened in, in human history. Um, fortunately, it did not. But we can also apply imply that if an eight inch uh, slip event um, did not cause a crevasse of the river, uh, then this had to have been higher than that. So this would imply maybe a foot or more of slip uh, in that event. And Fisk uses boring profile to see the history of movement over time. And importantly, down in the Pleistocene, he measured about three and a half feet of offset. So again, the cumulative effect of movement over time, eight inches of surface, uh, three and a half feet at, at uh, 40 feet below the surface, meaning it has been repeated episodic movement on this fault. This event was just the most recent of those. So we kind of have a range of magnitudes here from, from the, the low end at the Baton Rouge Fault, uh, the Highway 11 Bridge Fault, the Montague Fault, the Vachery Fault. And it, I think it's important to try to understand this in the context of something like earthquake magnitude and frequency. It's not a direct tie, but I think it's, it's, it's a good way to think about it. So global earthquakes uh, ranging in scale from a, a Richter scale of 1 to 8, the occurrence over a million events uh, of, of magnitude 1 and maybe 1 every year of magnitude 8. We just had a 7.8 in Turkey. Um, so this, this gives us a, a, a way to look at uh, the distribution. So for fault slip, uh, we can say uh, a range maybe of a tenth of an inch per year to, uh, to or a tenth of an inch in individual movement to uh, one foot, I'm sorry, a hundredth of an inch to uh, one foot. Uh, and the importance is to understand this distribution and, and how often it might occur. So we do have examples of real uh, impacts uh, and, and other potential impacts. Uh, the one we know, of course, the Highway 11 bridge fault, uh, a, a fault measured uh, with LIDAR data across New Orleans. Uh, DACA related those to uh, fractures uh, on Gentilly Boulevard. Uh, there is a fault that can be seen uh, at St. Rose by a tree line. It's also a, a subject of university study, and there's a subsurface fault plane and the intersection of that fault on a road. And uh, flood protection infrastructure appears to be showing impacts. Uh, there's offsets on uh, uh, flood protection walls in St. Bernard Parish and uh, the failure of the, of the uh, St. Bernard Highway, which may be related to faults. We don't have direct indication of that. But to get to, the, to get to where we can make those determinations, we need to consider three components of a geological atlas map, monitor, and model. And mapping is just the extension, extrapolation, or continuation of the university research which has happened to date. This is going to require some funding, but if we can continue to provide the universities with 3D seismic surveys, I believe that they will continue to produce interpretations of faults, and we can eventually get coverage across South Louisiana, which will allow for the construction of an atlas. Uh, this has started to some extent. The, the Department of Transportation had a project in which they took the existing documented university research and put it on their website. So we have the uh, embryonic stage of a GIS application with faults in it. Um, hopefully we'll see this continue to develop. And then monitoring, uh, I, I mentioned starting by looking at intersection points. Where do we have faults that we know exist that cross, in this case, flood protection infrastructure? Uh, 
start to monitor uh, around those intersections, create areas of interest. And part of that would be increasing the density of our static GPS measurements. So right now, this density is not great enough to detect in, uh, differential movement on either side of a fault. We could begin to uh, employ stations on either side of these faults to see if we can uh, measure differential rates. Uh, and then uh, use this also to measure model changes in uh, the surface of the uh, land surface area to see if we can establish a relationship between faulting surface velocities and, and changes going forward. Uh, better understanding the stress fields and doing more, um, more um, seismic monitoring to integrate into a model uh, which can make predictions about changes in the future. And ultimately, this will allow us to make some predictions about how often and what magnitude event we may have and how that might impact our infrastructure um, in the longer term. Also, just a quick note for the application of this model, which I didn't have time to really get into, but certainly there are thousands of wastewater injection wells below the surface. These all may um, have some significant relation to, um, to faulting. And then as, as uh, DEQ and DNR begin to regulate uh, CO2 sequestration, uh, a fault atlas would be incredibly valuable to them uh, to carry out that task. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your time. Please contact me. I would like to get some feedback on this. It's my intention to try to pursue um, legislative funding for the construction of an atlas. If you have time to drop me a note and let me know your thoughts. I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, if, if, if you're opposed or you think it's a bad idea, I want to know that as much as if you think it's a good idea. So thank you. Uh, please get in touch.